Oh, that's quite a nice bird going now. It's coming back this way, is it? Last day of the season at Ollie oh, Williams' no, family no. shoot in Cornwall, and it's not going well for some of the guns. That's what we like to see. <laughs> the whole line. It'd help if you take the safety off, Charles. We're out with Field Sports Nation member Dave Hayes, who's doing amazing work cooking up a feast of game for scout groups across the southeast of England. We might just beat burgers, sort of, because this is really good. I really like this. We have a good news feature this week. Deborah Hadfield discovers that DEFRA is about to pay us for shooting foxes. Happy days. And we're at Crackshot, where air gun expert James Head pitches two of the world's most popular spring-loaded air guns against each other. We're giving away a Spartan bipod from gun shop Bailey's Countrywear, priced at £289. David brings you the news on the new stump, and James Marchington has hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Yeah. We're in Cornwall on a driven pheasant day at the end of January, hosted by Ollie Williams. Now, why is he walking like an old man? He explains, and it's not glamorous. Yeah, last day of the year, but sort of my, I suppose, first day back from this injury I've had. We had a great driven hunt in, in Germany, and uh, after the hunt, I, um, my hooker by crook fell off a balcony and fell a good, a fair way. Can we have and, a uh, bit more detail? I mean, fell off a balcony a fair way. That doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, obviously, there was alcohol involved. There, What's you know, there? Cool. Oh, God forbid. Slip yeah. minus fourteen, icy, um, and I just. It was ice, was it? Yeah, it was sheet ice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I managed to break my pelvis, break my ribs. Here we go. Ah! 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 Hello, boys. I was being a very good host then, you see, letting most of that flush go down to my friends and then when they were reloading on that last bird, I thought... Anyway, back to where we were. Um, forward! I fell off this balcony, I think it was about two stories. It wasn't, it, you know, it, it, human beings aren't really designed to... to, um... Ah! Here we go. Oh, Ollie, moron. But you do feel it then, that reaching for that, oh, that hurts slightly. Yeah, well, oh no, one barrel. Ah, ah that's a good bird. Oh, she's got a bird, that's good. Now I'd love to tell her I told her to go and get that, but she, um, she when I have a gun in my hand, she's good as gold when I'm Good girl, good girl. She's good as gold when I can concentrate on her, but as soon as I have a gun in my hand, and Mr. Templar warned me this would happen, she knows full well what, what the game is, so she knows I'm not paying attention to her, so she will go off and do her own thing. Forward, that's quite a nice bird, going down, it's coming back this way, is it? Forward, boys, Henry! That's what we like to see. <laughs> the whole line. Oh dear. 14 shots. Sorry, Stefan, your hard work's not really being brought to fruition at this point. Um, anyway, back to, the, back to the story. So, I was sat in, sat in an ambulance, and I do remember thinking, because I realised I was in a bit of trouble at this point, because they worried about my internal organs and all sorts. I just remember sitting in the ambulance, being like, what a crap way to die this would be. <laughs> you know, I had these wonderful visions of me being caught by a buffalo, you know, deepest, deepest Africa or whatever. But, uh, Oh, they're going for the pigeon. Um, but no, I, 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 instead I was uh, sat in the back of a German ambulance, feeling sorry for myself. So Death by balcony. Death by balcony, indeed. Ollie is the one with the disability sticker on his peg. It looks like those on better pegs are creating their own infirmities. It'd help if you take the safety off, Charles. Despite the shooting, they do bring down birds. Guys, if we start making our way back to the, um, to the bus. The next drive is a hanging wood, with birds flushing out over guns in fields below. The team of guns out today are a mixture of people from the world of game shooting, locals and other friends. Uh, some locals, some not. Basically a mixture of a couple of guys who I shoot with elsewhere, family, friends, 
Good bunch of guns. So, so you had uh, beaters yesterday and beaters tomorrow. This is your last day. Well, basically, we just do the, the same drives the beaters did again. Um, if we got enough birds and we have a few birds kicking back this year, so we're just doing the same drives again. This is supposed to be the year when shoots like yours have no birds at all because of bird flu and lack of supply and bird flu. And how have you got over it? Well, I think you know it's it, it's if you had it and you, you were unlucky enough to get bird flu, then yeah, you you were you were you were either wiped out or severely hampered. But we got lucky. We had, obviously we had those issues with hexameter earlier in the year. One of the guns out today is Ollie's Cornish spearfishing friend, Matt Coombe. I would say spearfishing is more bit more like deer stalking than this driven day is, but there is a really good community, well, especially today. I mean, some of these chaps, I met them last night, and we've had a good laugh last night and this morning. So there's definitely that with the, the similarities, and we're going to eat what we shoot. Same spearfishing. When I, when I get home tonight, my daughter will be waiting for me to tell her what we're going to have for dinner tomorrow night. Which I think is the best way to be. When you're four years old and you're excited about eating pheasant or eating bass or lobster or scallops or whatever I'm bringing home, or deer, well, what a better way to be. It's not fish fingers and chicken nuggets in our house. <laughs> it is a day of changeable weather. Ollie moves the guns around to take advantage of where he reckons the birds will fly. As long as you, I go down through there. I don't think you'll get any shooting there. Okay, just have it. Henry, go towards Harry. You're between Harry and Ali. So now he's moving. He watches all the birds fight the wind and all of their, all their natural possible instincts and go exactly where I've moved them from. The weather brightens up for the next drive. I am standing with Digby Taylor, who works for online shoot finder Guns on Pegs, and like Ollie, is tempted by a high pigeon. What are the chances they're going to get that? <laughs> I mean, oh, is it coming over me? It's not coming over you because it's <laughs> 35,000 feet. I mean, technically, it's coming over you just like the sun comes over you. But what's the point of shooting it? I, mean, I don't know. They're all going for the uh, the prize money at the end of the day at the minute. I think they are. Digby explains what guns on pegs can do for a shoot like this and why he loves this kind of shooting. Someone like this don't really use guns on pegs all that much. The odd day every now and then, but um, uh, you know, an inquiry every year building the waiting list, that's what it's all about really. The topography is phenomenal. I mean, it's really, really quite special. And I love shooting on family days as well. I mean, there's nothing better than shooting with the family. Um, I know when you're shooting on a paid day, you're treated as a guest and all that. But um, a day like this at the end of the season with Ollie kindly hosting us is, um, yeah, it's really good fun. Tell me about next season. We couldn't have predicted COVID. We certainly mm. could have predicted the second year of COVID. And I don't think we could have predicted bird flu. No. So what's going to hit us next time? Well, I don't know. I mean, this year's been interesting because we worked out that we're about 30% down on birds put down this year, this season. And I thought it would make a bigger difference than it has. Um, and all of the days I've been on, certainly, I'm sure you'll attest to this, they just absolutely love what they've been doing. And, you know, if the bag's a few light or you're not shooting partridge or whatever it is, I thought it would cause an issue, I thought people noticed, but it's just been, a, you know, it's nice to get out, isn't it? Um, so that was, that was this year. Next year is an interesting one. Um, <laughs> when COVID hit, I was on our podcast strongly saying that COVID would be a two-week jobby. Um, and uh, the team at Guns on Pegs remind me of that nearly every fortnight. Um, so I'm always cautious about making predictions. Um, but it seems like people have diversified where they're getting their stock from. Um, the French game farm seems seem to be optimistic. Um, we might be a bit light on partridge, is the, the talk at the minute, but um, so many people have you know, kept overwinter stock and that sort of thing that the, in the UK, um, that the pheasants themselves. It's yours. Ah. Oh, you caught my gun jamming. <laughs> Poor Digby. It is now mid-afternoon and there are only a couple of drives left. Time to find out how Ollie's broken bones are coping. Shooting with a cast on his wrist is not, he says, holding Ollie back. It's a bit clunky, but I'm sort of just holding him and I've got a bit of in the fingers, so holding it in the fingers. Uh, not so much in the hand as you can probably see, it's quite clunky there, but um, no, it's all right. We are in the woods in a steep-sided valley for the last couple of drives and this is where Cornish game shooting plays its ace. It's a great county for Woodcock. At the end of the day, the bag is in the 70s, almost exactly the same as the bag the previous day, the Beater's Day. 
It's over and out for Ollie's family shoot for the 2022-2023 season. Thank you everybody, what a fantastic day. Uh, enjoy tomorrow. I won't be out to the hospital point, but thank you so much for another amazing season. Thank you, Ollie, Gamekeeper Nathan, and all of the team who put that day together. Now, celebrating Bailey's collaboration with Ray Trade UK at the British Shooting Show, we're offering one lucky winner a Spartan Pro Hunt Bipod Standard. Priced at £289, it's kindly donated by gun shop Bailey's Country Wear. You'll find John Bailey on the Ray Trade stand at the British Shooting Show on the 17th to the 19th of February 2023 at the NEC outside Birmingham. If you'd like to know how to enter the draw, watch the Field Sports Nation's own TV show Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays. And you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation for £5 a month, which you can also do at the British Shooting Show on our stand. Details of that later in this show. Come on over and poke Packham. Next, to complete the companion set, it is time to visit Chief Poker David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A Saab who spat on a farmer at a Boxing Day hunt meet has been convicted of assault. She was arrested at the Fitzwilliam Hunt's meet in Cambridgeshire after she spat on the farmer's face. The Saab also screamed at passing riders. I wonder which one might fall off and break their neck. She lunged at the farmer before police grabbed her and carried her away. The Saab pleaded guilty to assault by beating and received a 12-month conditional discharge. She's been ordered to pay compensation, court costs and an additional surcharge. Everybody is entitled to peaceful protest, but their behaviour of this anti-hunting activist was appalling. We praise the police for taking swift action against those who are intent on sabotaging a lawful activity and who pose a serious threat to those who take part. Bird flu is spilling over into mammals, including foxes and otters. The Animal and Plant Health Agency, APHA, tested 66 mammals, including seals, and found nine otters and foxes were positive for avian influenza, H5N1. APHA adds that there is a very low likelihood of any widespread infection in GB mammals. Dominic Bolton from Aim to Sustain says farmers, gamekeepers and shooters have minimised risks with biosecurity measures. Uh, we've now been through a complete shooting season with no reports of any um, shooting related activities being responsible for uh, transmission of the disease. Exmoor's wild deer may be linked to an outbreak of TB in local cattle herds. That's the conclusion of scientist Keith Collard, who tested more than 100 wild red deer in the area. 30 deer tested positive for TB. Dr Collard said there is a significant correlation between the number of farms with TB reactors and the number of TB positive deer in the regions. Dr Collard finds that Tony Blair's stag hunting ban is a factor. The lack of disturbance due to hunting with hounds has had a major effect on the tendency for deer to congregate in high concentrations, which has contributed to the high level of TB in deer. Thanks to Richard Walton for the story. The BBC has announced it's cancelling the Autumn Watch programme shortly after Chris Packham revealed that he was taking a break from television. The broadcaster blamed challenging times financially. Packham says he has cancelled all TV work for three months to create abstract sculptures of birds, snakes and humpback whales. He is also threatening to sue Field Sports Channel for libel, and you can read his correspondence with us via the link below. A feasibility study is underway to explore reintroducing black grouse to Sussex. Natural England is funding the report, which will establish if the species could be released at Ashdown Forest. The site that has been identified for the possible release is a 2,500 hectare area of open heathland and woodland along the High Weald in East Sussex. It is the largest area with open public access in South East England. Currently, the species is found in Northern England, North Wales and Scotland, but its range used to extend further south. Ashdown Forest was the last stronghold for the species in Sussex, which persisted there until the early 1900s, with the last on record a female spotted in 1937. Basque says the future of Wales's most threatened species is at risk because of a potential snare ban. The criticism comes after the publication of the Economy, Trade and Rural Affairs Committee's report on the Agriculture Wales Bill. 
The majority of the committee's members voted to ban snares in Wales. Two members noted that a blanket ban removes any opportunity to use snares as a method of predator control for restoring species, including projects funded by the Welsh Government. Basque's Wales director Steve Griffiths says the use of the most modern snare designs, known as humane cable restraints, have an important role to play in land management and the conservation of ground nesting birds. A wildlife charity is asking for action from the UK's national grid after five swans flew into new power lines. The Secret World Wildlife Rescue found the swans dead on the ground near newly built pylons in Somerset. One swan was still alive and they released it. The Wildlife Rescue staff claim that when swans collide with power lines, it blows them apart. A one-eyed seal trapped in a Essex reservoir that was eating up all the fish has died. The Marks Hall Fisheries Lake was forced to close when the seal swam in and evaded capture. It is estimated the visitor has eaten £3,000 worth of fish. It was also eating local ducks. The seal, which spent weeks in the lake, had multiple injuries. The British Divers Marine Life Rescue decided to anaesthetise the animal in the hope of rescuing it, but the seal was trapped underwater and died. Nick North, who leases the lake from the local council, says he had nothing to do with the decision to use a tranquilizer dart on the animal and he's have sent him death threats. The Australian politician who released the addresses of firearms owners to a newspaper is now asking for those same firearms owners to have mental health checks. 20 people died from gunshot wounds in Western Australia last year, and Police Minister Paul Papalia says mental health issues were involved in at least half of those deaths. He fails to mention that 18 of those 20 deaths were from illegal guns. He claims he's not being vindictive or punitive towards gun owners. They think differently. Thanks to Jeff Hotchkiss for the story. And finally, scientists have revealed that Neanderthals hunted elephants that weighed up to 12 tons. The study carried out by Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany analyzed the 125,000 year old remains of a prehistoric species of giant elephant, around twice the size of the modern day animal, with tusks that reached up to 10 feet in length, giving it the name the straight tusked elephant. Marks found on the bones suggest the mammals had been thoroughly butchered to ensure all meat and fat was stripped from the bone. The meat could feed up to 100 people for a month. Thank you to Per Homseth for the story. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder, and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thank you, David. Later in the show, find out details of DEFRA's Fox Shooting Payments Plan. Now a word from the Northern Shooting Show. This is a shakedown Order up that beat just like a takeout Show me you got soul inside those new shoes And you can rock and roll with the attitude So good, so fresh, just the way you like it To avoid confusion, the British Shooting Show is at the NEC in Birmingham next weekend, the 17th to the 19th of February 2023. The Northern Shooting Show is in Harrogate in May. Now, Dave Hayes is a scout leader and Field Sports Nation member. He is making it a mission to teach kids about wild game. Well, you need to, this is where you need to get your fingers in. Oh, oh. Okay. Field Sports Nation member Dave Hayes is introducing a new generation to the joys of eating game. He combines his love of shooting with his work as a scout leader to run hands-on game cooking demonstrations for scout groups across the southeast of England. Whilst you get a lot of kind of, ooh, I don't want to touch it, actually they, they do get involved in it really well. It's always, it's always a, a session with high energy, a lot of noise, it's quite frenetic, a bit chaotic. But it's, it's good fun. We always start with a briefing and I'll talk the scouts through what I'm going to do. Uh, just so they are 
although they know they're coming in to do pheasant, or whether it's rabbit or whatever it may be, uh, I still like to talk them through it. Some of them were a bit reticent, even though they know what they're coming in for. But I always talk them through what I'm going to do, just so it takes that bit of surprise out. So when I get a knife out and open up the skin or whatever else and then take the skin off with its pheasant, they understand what's going to happen. So it gives them the opportunity to step away. I think that's important. That it, it, scouting, scouts needs to be a safe space for them. If they feel uncomfortable with it, then they shouldn't be pressured into doing it. So all that would do is turn them off it altogether. I give them a bird each, uh, and then myself and the other leaders work with them to make sure they're doing it properly and safely. Get a burner in a pan and they and they cook it up and eat it. We always give them a wrap and generally sauce to go with it as well, just to just to make it a bit more interesting rather than just eating a, a pan full of diced pheasant, which would be a bit a bit miserable, really, wouldn't it? So it just livens it up a little bit, and again, it gets them all involved. And the benefit of doing that kind of taking that approach as well is the more the more things that need doing, it means that each scout can get involved. <laughs> It ticks a number of boxes, or if we look at the badges behind actually, you know, they've got various activity badges and challenge badges. So for scouts, if they're doing bushcraft or cookery, or even down to sort of nature and wildlife and, and camping, etc., it all kind of comes together quite nicely. So through one activity, just taking a pheasant and preparing it, cooking it and eating it, they're using knife skills, they're using cookery skills, it's, it's kind of bushcraft skills, if you like, as if they were wild camping or something like that. So it does tick a lot of boxes. This for me, thank you. I was going to do it like a puzzle. Right. Do let us know. It's very good. Scoop it on the wrong side. You're going to try some. Yeah. Really, not nice. It's like the flavour though is really amazing. I think it's really good that we we were able to do this. Yeah. One thing I do try to do is make that connection between the food they eat, the meat they eat, especially, and where it's come from. I didn't like the bit where it was all like bloody and that, but when I started doing my own, it was quite fun. Excellent. I wanted to get some wood pigeon to do a session with scouts and uh, I put a message out on, uh, I think it was Beaters and Pickers Up, asking if someone local to the area could provide me with 26 wood pigeons and uh, the response was overwhelming. It is very nice. And I, th I think it's really nice that there's that mindset within the shooting community about getting young people involved because, you know, when I look on shoots now, that. I think the average age is maybe creeping up, you know, so trying to get some young blood in, I think, is, is really good. Well, I'm not sure, but after I've tasted this, I'm pretty sure this might just be burgers, sort of, because this is really good, I really like this. A very good evening. Well, I think the, the, the noise level always is a good indication of that. You know, there was a lot of noise, there's a lot of laughter, there's a lot of moving around, they're moving between each other's tables, seeing how they're getting on. Uh, there was clearly a bit of a debate at the end who's going to have the spare pheasant, which is quite nice, and it's gone off to a good home, it seems, uh, to a family who raw feed their dog, so everyone's happy. So I think tonight was a success, and, which is great. So, uh, and actually the leaders came in for the Cubs, and they've taken my details as well because they want to do the session with the Cubs. So, uh, yeah, well, hopefully that will be equally as fun. Quite nice, actually, for anyone who does watch this from a shooting community, if they've got kids in Scouts, maybe they could speak to their scout leaders about doing a similar session. One of the leaders here this evening was saying it's the sort of thing he used to do when he was a, a scout as a kid. But we've kind of, we've just moved away from that. I think we just drifted away from it, you know, so it would be nice to kind of make it a bit more mainstream, I think, but it might be something that some of the shooting community could sort of help support and boost a little bit. And say if they've got kids who are in, in scouts or cubs, then maybe they could get involved and, uh, and run a similar session. It's quite, it's quite straightforward, and it is good fun. Hip hip! Hooray! 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 One for luck. Hip hip! You can support our work by joining the Field Sports Nation for just five pounds a month. Link below, and to find your local scout group, go to scouts.org.uk. Thanks, Dave. Now a word from thermal and night vision specialist Scott Country. Never break, always fight, never quit, do it right, play the 
game, win a life, have no shame. Next, Deborah Hadfield has some good news for crow and fox shooters. And, surprisingly, it's come from the government. Managing predators is a daily battle for farmers, gamekeepers and landowners. Yeah, now the government signals it will recognise this effort and pay shooters for the work. It doesn't say when or how much, but it includes predator control in the latest round of proposed farm subsidies. Totally sensible. The NGO have been pushing for something like this for a long time, it'll be a big benefit. So what's the point of putting a million pound or whatever the things are into creating the habitat, getting all these red list and amber list birds, particularly the waders, and then just let the foxes and crows eat them. We've been doing it for free for a hell of a long time. And that comes through the evidence base as well. You want to find big chunks of ground nesting birds, you go where it's very well keepered. So it would be fantastic to have some sort of compensation coming back into those farm businesses through these agreements to help offset the costs of effective predator management done through the gamekeeping team or whatever. So that would be really helpful. The ray of hope comes from an update in the government's Environmental Land Management Schemes, or ELMS. This is DEFRA's post-Brexit answer to the Common Agricultural Policy Payment System. The schemes, which are due to roll out next year, focus on paying farmers and landowners to enhance the natural environment. As part of ELMS, DEFRA Minister Trudy Harrison reveals what the government is considering. Asked about curlew protection, she admits that the management of predators, such as crows and foxes, plays an important role and she promises actions in ELMS. It will allow for a larger amount of predator management through a bigger landscape. And that is one of the things we really need to make species be able to thrive. Because if you have a little isolated area where you have predator management, you just get re-recruitment from the outside. So building out these areas where you have effective predator management will be such good news for everybody. We should start to see, or have a good chance of seeing, species start to recover quite quickly. If you create all this habitat, the, the red list birds and amber list birds will come in and breed. But then you've got to protect them when they're breeding or after they've fledged so that they get a chance of getting a foothold in population again. Shooters can also take heart from positive news announced under the Species Recovery Sections of Elms, promising bespoke actions for anyone taking predator control. What it does is, it, in a nutshell, it provides that missing part of the jigsaw. Government has been very good at paying for good habitat management, but without this bit of the jigsaw for some species, it just doesn't work. It is very significant, I think, for government to just address that piece they've been reticent about addressing, which is species management, wildlife management. You know, they have dedicated teams who understand it, but there needs to be the political will to implement it. And so we have that now. We have these sort of hard targets um, for, for 2030, for England anyway, and all the UK has some hard targets through signing up to the Convention on Biological Diversity as well, which has you know, pretty similar sorts of targets. So there now is the political will to make this work. Hopefully we've been appreciated for what we're doing. Keepers have been doing this forever, part of our job, and everything needs to be kept in a balance. You can't have all top apex predators, which all these bunny huggers want. With a focus on overturning the decline of species, particularly farmland and moorland birds, shooters look like they will get public money to fund predator control. More details on the ELM scheme below. Thanks all who took part in that. Now from the ends to the means, this week's field tester is about spring-loaded air guns pitting the Vaurach HW97K against the Air Arms TX200. So in my right, I've got the Air Arms TX200. This one is the standard length one, not the Hunter Carbine. They do do it in Hunter Carbine, which is a little bit shorter, and it does you allow uh, a fitting of a silencer if you wished. This one is sporting the Beach Stock. And in my left, I've got the HW97KT, so it's a thumbhole stock. Again, beach stock, silencer. This one is sporting a Hawk fast mount scope as well. They are probably our biggest selling springers. They are also the ones that probably create the biggest debate when buying. So it's always a, do I go for this one? Do I go for that one? Uh, there's pros and cons of both. I think it's down to personal choice in the end. Personally, I'd have a TX200. The trigger wasn't as good as the HW97, 
I just prefer it. It was a little bit softer in the shoulder. Uh, there wasn't as much felt recoil, which I know sounds silly for an air gun, but there is recoil. The 97 was nice to shoot. The cocking was short and smooth, so it wasn't feel like a really long stroke. It was nice, short and crisp, and the trigger was nice and crisp on this one as well. But the shot cycle was a little bit harsher than the TX. I also found the TX a little bit more comfy for shooting. So obviously comfort overalls, I'm going for the TX. So the fit for me has to be absolutely perfect. So if I'm happy, comfortable using something, I'm gonna be you know shooting out a lot more accurately and better than I will something that isn't as comfortable. So the TX is a lot more expensive. So this one comes in at 630 pounds in the beach stock, whereas the H97 in the carbine thumb hole comes in at 550. But I think the expense is justified in this gun um, just by the way it shoots. For more about Crackshot, its range of air guns and the ranges in which you can try them out, visit crackshot.uk. From Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting films on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First, a lovely film of a team from Holtz Auctioneers shooting driven pheasants and partridge with black powder muzzle loaders. Irish Hunter is finding his pheasants the hard way, walking up over springers and a red setter, filming it with a GoPro and a shot cam. Here's a report from the BBC from the annual stag calling contest at Dortmund in Germany. Being the BBC, they can't bring themselves to mention why anyone would want to call a stag, referring instead to communing with nature. Over to New Zealand, and a very different type of stalking. Souls Untapped enters a spearfishing competition and battles to overcome rough water and bad visibility. Meanwhile, Ted from Ted's Holdover is stalking feral pigeons around the farmyard with his FX Wildcat Mark III and pulling off some impressively long shots. Stuart from Vermin Control Scotland goes after rats in what must be the untidiest barn in the country and kills 80 plus with the aid of his Hick Micro Alpex scope on a 2 2 crate bullpup air rifle. More farmyard pest control, this one from Profile One. Wild Fowling, who's using his 20 bore pump action hush power to shoot crows. And finally, Jeff from the Last Stand channel is on his annual bobcat hunting trip to Arizona. It's packed with tips and tricks for outwitting this wily quarry, and they manage a bonus coyote too. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link. Charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about the show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday, and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.